of loneliness and misery and suffering and unhappiness, and it's all over much too quickly. The question is, have I learned anything about life? Hello, everybody. Zane Zenokami here as your host for a special episode of Essence of Zen After Dark, the podcast where you can find all of your geek, nerd, tech, and gaming trends, if not a bit more. Today, I'm joined by a special guest, a good friend of mine, and also essentially someone who I consider a movie buff. I'm talking about my great friend, Ishiak Ponier. How you doing, Ishiak? I'm doing good. Thanks for introducing me, Zane. No problem. So yep. <laughs> we're, we're here. We're uh, we're talking. Um, I'm assuming the viewers and listeners, well, the viewers who are watching the podcast will know what today's episode about. Uh, for the listeners, they can't see the the epic shirt that I have on, uh, which ironically was a gift from you. Which again, oh, you're wearing you it. The, I'm wearing, yes, <laughs> I, I didn't notice in the video before. <laughs> I didn't notice. I just looked at the background. I was like, there it is. <laughs> Oh, there's the pre- there's the other version of it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, uh, did, did, remind me. Did I did I, did I get you the one specific to the Snyder cut? Yes, the it says Zack Snyder's Justice League, and then it has the Justice League logo. But yeah, yeah, okay, good. I hope it was the official one. I know eBay has some scalper. <laughs> <laughs> Does it does is the, is the logo in place? Like, is it centered right? Does it feel like someone just printed it on there, or is it actually? Oh no, it it feels legit. It looks legit. It looks well made. Everything lines up from what I can tell. Yeah, I hope it's legit because I wouldn't. I mean, it wasn't expensive, but I wouldn't pay that for for, for, for <laughs> something that was just printed on a T-shirt on like a, you know those those services they have for companies to print stuff. I forget the names. Yeah, uh, I mean, we we actually went to one a while like two years ago. Anyway, but yeah, that's cool. So, yeah, for those who are curious, we're going to be talking about Zack Snyder's Justice League. So what we thought about it, how it was, and you know, the, just in general, we're just talking about the movie as a whole. So uh, Ishak, since you're the first guest of season two, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, like, man, what, what were your thoughts? How, how did you feel about it? Uh, so if you had talked to me like right after I watched it again, you remember I took a whole day out of work, not necessarily for that, but it was a good, as a key component to just decide taking the day off because I only take off maybe one or two days a month. For vacations, if it's sickness, I can't help it. If you had asked me when I just first watched, I was like, "That was the best film I ever watched <laughs> in my life." <laughs> it was hands down the best DC Extended Universe film. I know Batman vs Superman has its detractors, but I think I mean everyone says Ultimate Edition. I understand if people are so skeptical, but it's one of those films I felt was influenced a lot by Frank Miller's work, that sort of mm-hmm. darkness. I'll also kind of. In a weird way, like every dark DC material, Death of Superman, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, uh, kind of the New 52 Wonder Woman run, I think. I didn't pay too much attention to that, but it sort of had sort of the feel of a newer interpretation of Wonder Woman. We had Doomsday, a lot of death and, you know, a lot of not not Marvel stuff, except for Endgame. We'll get, but that's another that's another. <laughs> So yeah, I felt very much, Batman vs. Superman felt like almost a niche niche film. Kind of like not exactly a direct um, interpretation of Dark Knight Returns, but in that same vein, as it is in the same vein of Death of Superman and every other storyline. And also the weird, I wouldn't say weird, but the but the integrated plot with you know the materials, the African storyline, also felt like it was kind of inspired by, you know, kind of more of a dark darker take on not just that world, but sort of the darker worlds of comics to get that real world. Um, kind of dark, kind of in the weird way, like Dark Knight, kind of like that whole reverse engineering of materials, kind of that whole intuitive aspect of it. But yeah, Batman vs Superman, I can see how it's divisive. It felt very niche, hmm. but this film, even though it had components of it, felt very integrated. Like I can't, I mean, with any DC fan, I can't, if they, I can't understand if a fan didn't at least like a lot of aspects of this film. Because it delivered a lot of good stuff that is very much, I think DC as a whole, darker, but also kind of in that darkness, it's kind of needed to embrace kind of the more lighter, triumphant thing themes of DC, kind of like more of that pantheon look of characters, how they're gods in a way. But in this film, they feel a lot more like gods, 
and there's a lot more consequence and kind of harder choices to be made. So I feel like when this, uh, so I guess to get to the point, I feel like this film sort of had that weight that the original release didn't have, while also kind of taking its time. I mean, it was four hours. It took a lot of time. But <laughs> it, it, I think it helped. I mean, if it was a miniseries, I mean, it would have been easy just to like forget about stuff, but having it integrated really paid off because the plot really, like chapters, the chapters built on each other. I, I really enjoyed it for that. Um, I think the four hours was a good idea. But having some time away from it, like think of it objectively, I feel like it was, like it doesn't change my opinion of the film. I still love the film, but it, the biggest thing that changed was my idea of where to go from here. I'm pretty okay with, kind of leaving this as the final chapter, kind of having it being like the amalgamation of years of fan support plus kind of bits and pieces of incorporated things that Zack Snyder wanted to put in the film uh, based on just leaks part two and three, mostly two from what we see that Dark Knight, uh, not Dark Knight, that nightmare uh, sequence, which I thought was, we'll get to that, but it was interesting, but I feel like it, like it completed that. It's the weirdest film that, I, besides Endgame, I didn't have a film kind of complete that feeling of you know resolve that you don't have with too many films nowadays. Everything's like building up to something, and then something if it's not building up to something, the payoff isn't as 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 good as the promise. Um, the pledge isn't as good as the promise for any prestige fans. Or the yeah. is it is it the promise? I forget the three stages of an act. Oh, the third stage is obviously the prestige. That's why the film's named that. <laughs> <laughs> the pledge, the turn, and the prestige. Uh, yeah, no, but it just it's satisfied in ways films rarely do nowadays, where it not only keeps all the promises it's made, but elevates the story and completes the narrative. So that's, I guess that's the biggest feeling you get. I get after. This time away from it, is it completed what I wanted it to complete? And it kept a promise. A good one, too. It's not like they had a lot of... It was like I thought, honestly, when the announcement came that it wasn't going to be all too different from the start without us looking at all those trailers. But thankfully, it really did deliver. That's why I feel like the biggest thing of that film is it delivered, especially to fans like us. Absolutely. I, I think that's... You know, because I I don't want to just delve into the potential toxicity of 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 hate campaigns because I don't want to feed unchecked conspiracy theories. But you know that train of thought aside, you know there was a, a clear indication that of the a mass of the public just did not really want to support anything by Zack Snyder. I mean, I mean, and I, and I mean that not by like the, the totality, but I meant like, uh, you know, YouTube, Twitter, mm -hmm. anybody who considered themselves like a, 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 an indie reviewer or an indie buff, you know, you had people from Collider, you had Screen Rant, comicbooks.com, comicbooksreview.com. And they're just, you know, first it was, you know, for, for, for ages, Snyder Cut doesn't exist, mm -hmm. you know? And it was, you know, we were told by Warner Brothers, uh, Zack Snyder signed off on all the things that uh, Josh Whedon uh, did, which we now know that was complete, you know, false. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't even look uh, at the film. Exactly. You know, the whole... Uh, what we, Russian we, family. We, <laughs> yes. Yes. So, we, you know... From, mm -hmm. They didn't tell you that half the film was his family? It's like, half the film? Yeah. There was nothing. You mean, oh, you mean Aquaman's people? That was a... No, no. In <laughs> Russia. You mean the place where I didn't have anyone because it's literally a bland, abandoned? <laughs> yeah, they put a, they put one family there, and a people full of buildings we never see that Superman carries. It's like what? Right, and that building looked <laughs> decrepit and like already torn. Like, I, any it just okay. I wish it was um, empty. That would be so funny. Like he heard like some sounds like oh, there's people in there, and it's like oh, it was a can that dropped. It's abandoned. <laughs> that does sound like some. Uh... Josh Whedon levels of humor, honestly. Um, but, you know, so with, with, with all of that going around and people saying it doesn't exist, it's not real, and Zach saying it's, it's, it's real, you know, is everything that I wanted to shoot, I shot. Mm -hmm. And then people saying, oh, well, you know, it's not complete. And he's like, yeah, because the shooting portion is not the, you know, 
time needed for CGI and all this other stuff. And stuff started to leak the the raws of Cyborg on the roof to sing out his jet. So then people was like, well, no, that's just, you know, cutting room floor stuff. It's not real, yada, yada, yada. Then it was announced. Yep. And then people changed their tune, right? And then mm-hmm. after it was announced, people will say, okay, well, it's not going to be that different. Yeah. And there, there's not that much new footage. And then people were just like, oh, it's going to be like four hours long. Mm. Well, okay, definitely. Okay, there's a lot more footage there then. Mm. But I, I bet uh, most of it's reshoots. And then we get the news that there were going to be some additional footage. And there's like, oh, he's going to re- reshoot hours of footage, and yada, yada, yada. Turns out it was like a total of 15, 20 minutes around that ballpark. And I couldn't even notice, but outside of the nightmare sequence, like what exactly the new stuff. The, I feel like the, maybe. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like maybe there were some still shots that might have been reshoots of characters, but outside that, no sequences I can I can think of that blatantly were felt like they were reshoots. Yes, uh, I believe there is a few shots of like Henry Cavill just standing. Yeah, the, the shots you're talking about, Seven and then yeah, I guess Seven is, <laughs> some of that. And, I, guess. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And literally, like, there's, there's a, of course, like you said, the nightmare scenes, and of course, like the, the, yeah. the very, very end. But I think there's a few more, and you can tell when it comes to Ben Affleck because he's back in shape. Like he, he, oh he's yeah, I know what it's But he <laughs> looks like, much healthier. Yeah, and he, him, him as well. Just a personal struggle he went through to, through it as Batman, and I think the character itself and how putting himself in that dark place kind of kicked back some of the. Um, I guess it's bad past demons with addiction, uh, mostly alcoholism. And I feel like you saw that in BVS a bit, even though it was a little, again, with actors, even though it was a little takeaway scene, you, maybe to get in the character, maybe they really put themselves in those dark pits. You just never know. But yeah, yeah I noticed I, that. I, I think that was, you know, probably why people really felt that Ben Affleck nailed it as Bruce and Batman. Because yeah. like you know him and his and, and, and you know nothing against this or not trying to pick on him but you know Affleck's real drinking addiction and if you look at the scenes <laughs> in BBS you can tell he's taking like he's popping pills and he's drinking yeah. alcohol and popping pills with alcohol and Alfred is making these snide remarks of the entire movie giving you the little crumbs here and there and I, I you know when you when you're someone who's been through that of course it'll be easier especially I think Affleck is a, is a great actor but it just adds more levels to it because. He 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 knows it, at least the alcohol part. I don't I don't know yeah. about his drug. I don't know. If, I don't know if anyone noticed or if this is a reach, but I noticed like if you look at the original opening sequence with him in Metropolis as Bruce Wayne, I mean he sounds very coherent. It could just be the situation because of his friend being in the building, very coherent, very sound. But then if you look at like let's say for example the when he's Bruce Wayne like in daytime, right? Uh, when they're talking about Lex Luthor, the the blacked out data um, Mm -hmm. coming from his residence. Uh, He's kind of, he sounds a little inebriated. He kind of talks a little slower, blah, 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 blah. That's when Alfred mentions the uh, wine cellar. (laughs) I feel like, I I did feel like that was on purpose to sort of go, as Bruce Wayne, he's just like, I don't like this life. I mean, maybe he's got tired of Bruce Wayne. Maybe he's, maybe he's tired of the Bruce Wayne persona. Mm -hmm. he's, He's been doing it for 20 years. And, how Bruce Wayne really didn't do anything really in terms of, compared to Batman, Batman and kind of, I just felt, I just remember thinking about that. Like he sounds a little like not slurry, but you know, like he's, you know, a little, a little out of it <laughs> as Bruce Wayne. He, yeah. yeah. A little bit, a little bit, or, or just a little, a little buzz, just yeah. a little bit. Um, and then he sort of puts on a facade for the, uh, it, at the actual party, but that's not really Bruce Wayne. That's like undercover Batman. Yeah, that's and, sort of when he when he comes back to it, and you you can really get that vibe because him all the way up to that point, and then when he runs into Clark, and then like oh, then he's, you can he's feel away. that <laughs> anger. Yeah, that that anger starts to actually goes in the front. He's like, you know, how many puff pieces and yada yada. It's like, oh, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, oh man. So so, and here's the thing. You know, I I'm biased. I'm I'm a I'm a Zack Snyder fan. Um, mm-hmm. But and you know I'll even admit that none of his movies are perfect. Very seldom yeah. movies are perfect. But yeah. the amount of attention to details, all the small pieces, all the little little dots that connects on a very granular scale, I think is really what drives things home. And I understand yeah. that for for many that can be considered too long of a slow burn or or, or too yep. nuanced and things like that. But it's it 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 what gives you so much 
depth and dynamics, in my opinion. So. Yeah, I feel like even with that same sequence you're talking about, like at the beginning, just talking about the data in the Portuguese at the, at the, at the beginning of the conversation, he was like kind of slurry, not really awake kind of in that scene. But then later when he's like, you know, you know, I'm, once to get, I need to get to this party and I, I need the suit. Like he's like astute. Like it's like Batman's his own. It's almost like Batman's and is also an addiction in a way, more so than it's like an altered persona because it gives him such a high. Yeah, I, I guess to sum it up, Batman in this world is like he's very real in the sense that he's had a lot of people fail him. He doesn't really care about the right way. He just cares about getting the right outcome. So you can just, I can understand that completely uh, watching this interpretation, which I feel like you have to really pay attention to. It's not really explicitly stated. Um, it's not spoon fed to you. There's a lot of subtleties about it with, with Snyder's films, kind of because he kind of wants to focus on the other stuff because there's a lot of the components of his film. Yeah. And he knows that, you know, if you pay attention, you'll, you'll get it and understand at least why his vision is this way. Definitely. But yeah, I like yeah, definitely. Uh, but yeah, I I think before Justice League when I first saw that, I mean, it, it put me off Ben Affleck's Batman because he was in parts good, but then the other parts really just far off the mark. I was like, yeah, Bale's Batman's the best. Bale's Batman's the best. I've been saying that <laughs> ever since Justice League. But then after watching Snyder Cut, I was like, that's the best Batman I've ever seen in a damn film. <laughs> I'm honest. Like that's like that's that, that I think. You know how in Marvel uh, there's quintessential characters like I can't see anyone else play Iron Man or Deadpool, somewhat Wolverine, but maybe someone's more comic book accurate. I can see that, but that Batman I think is the closest we got to that, like an on-screen Batman. That's like you can't really I can't really see anyone do better than that. Just Agreed. capturing. Agree, like 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 hardcore belief. Um, agree, excuse me. My brother Blaine, when um when Affleck was first cast as Bruce and Batman uh, in BVS, um, a brother did not like it. He had nothing against Affleck. He actually said, you know, he looks the part, but he had two problems. One, he has seen Affleck in so many prior movies that he could not see anybody but Ben Affleck, you know, in that mm -hmm. role. So he, he he couldn't disappear for him at first. And he also didn't like the fact that they went with a, a, a already established Batman, but yet a mm -hmm. new Superman. It just kind of it, it ruined his his dream idea of like you know the two heroes you know putting on the capes around the same time and yada yada mm -hmm. yada. At least saw BVS, he had his 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 concerns about it, his issues with, about it, but he enjoyed it. It was like you know entertaining, but he actually liked Bruce and Batman more so Batman. And I was like, there you go. Um, and then when Whedon's uh, Justice League came out, I, I, I got to admit, I, one, I, I hated the, the blue tint they gave his suit. Oh. I, I understand yeah. that that's, you know, at one point in time in, in different eras of, of DC, Batman has had a slightly dark blue tinted suit. Mm -hmm. I get that. I'm not one to say that that's right or wrong. Personally, I just prefer the black suits. Yeah. And to see that, returned with the 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 color grading in snyder's justice league oh like, yeah it, it looks it looks so much better it, it, <laughs> oh it, yeah not just because of the color but because the the, the presence the, yes and just the just the the, the details just looked mm. better in a darker mm. color for it. i i i it, it, oh man i mean uh, we didn't did make super friends so it explains the colors yeah yeah. That's what but, it felt like. But see, you know, e even there, I did not like the color co uh, the, the color uh, grading that he did on Superman's suit in Justice League. No, and, and th th mean, about Whedon's. Yeah, yeah, it's weird because they did this thing. They did this weird thing where it's like Superman lives, where they put if you see the solid documentaries for how they made that suit, they put like it under, they put like this, like uh, I don't know, metal or not metallic, but close enough. Like it was, it was plating underneath the suit that mm -hmm. reflected a lot of light so when you put the the suit on the actual uh, fabric of the suit on it it had this glean to it so that's why it looked weird especially with that grading it yeah. just looked very like 
cartoonish super friends, I guess. But th- 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 Perfect th- example. This is the funny thing to me. You know how people complain about Man of Steel for having quote unquote washed out colors? Mm-hmm. I felt when like. They, mm-hmm? th- they have, when they, th- instead of washed out, they're more like, it's too much. <laughs> it's like, turn off the film. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I, like so, Whedon's blue in Superman's suit in in his Justice League just felt like it was grayish, bluish with white splashed in. It it didn't, it didn't fit with the color that he did for Flash and Wonder Woman, and it it, it yeah. Because yeah, don't, don't get me wrong, Whedon's color grading for Flash and Wonder Woman actually looked very appealing. I'm not gonna lie. I liked it. Yeah, I think so. But Batman uh, as, and and Aquaman yeah. and and Superman, their suits looked weird for for whatever reason. Yeah, I think it's because those textures, kind of, well, they're very really, they're really saturated, especially when when you talk about how Zach specifically laid out those three character suits, especially Batman, where it really does help to make it darker, just because of the suits textures themselves, as well as Superman with the, um, like the under 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 um plating that he had it going on but yeah i can like especially when you try embossing the colors like he did i think it was i think to some degree is made for consistency uh due to well he made the final sequence sequence orange because the the whole layout of that barrier was orange maybe he wanted just everything to be orange to signify you know it's everywhere now rolled rolled it's easy signifier that the whole world is ending, right? To make yeah. everything the same color, make it the same grade, and kind of saturate, especially at the very end. I, I, um, I, I still felt weird by it though, because it felt barfy, and I, and I don't mean that in like the the most like ob- obvious way. When I first saw it, and, and, and to, the, also for the record, when I saw the original Whedon's Justice League, I didn't hate it. I, I, I liked it. it. I you know it just it felt off. Um, yeah. But the the, I, the orange just felt like again someone barfed a bunch of colors on the screen and, and and maybe it's because I I just personally don't like that much saturation and that much color. I'm not I'm not a fan of the the, the Guards of the Galaxy color gambit because it it, it looks like rainbow anime bubblegum uh, unicorn vomit to me. I I, uh. I I think it was fine for those films because they were comedic and it really it lightened the mood a lot. I I will say if Josh Joss um, had um maybe incorporated different colors. I mean, the final shot of the mother boxes and the life may be a good example, but like incorporating different colors as opposed to just making a, a tint maybe would have made not only the other, the base color stand out, but would make the scene more, feel more fleshed out. But if just changing the tint really didn't add anything to it for yeah. me. And making things brighter also, it, it didn't, like you, I just was, I guess the biggest thing is it was just weird. Especially the final sequence, the fight sequence. Yeah, and I think I, I might have to blame contrast as being the thing that, yeah. that was missing, because you know I, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, thinking back about it, and I remember the scenes where they're they're heading towards the nuclear tower that Steppenwolf is in in, in the weeding cut, and because it's so bright, it, it looks like it's still kind of day, right? That's what I thought too. Yeah. And then at the end, you know, when they're getting ready to get on the the carrier ship, the sun is rising, and it's like, wait, I, wait, what? Was there was time moving like th- th- that much time go by because it it yeah, seemed very I thought, consistent. I thought it was a, I mean, honestly when I first saw it, I thought maybe a day went by. Yeah, but then you see uh, Snyder's cut, and then you get you get the the bright lights of the explosions contrasting with the darkness of the actual time of day, and then when you do the the final scene of you know the Stephen Wolf being defeated, and then they get on top and they have the carrier, and you get the sun is rising, and you get like the the imagery like like they 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 fought in the dark, they beat the darkness, and now the light is able to shine once mm-hmm. more, and mm-hmm. it 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 just adds so much more depth to that entire sequence. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I agree to that. Um, I, yeah, I feel like with Snyder's, it just was. I guess timing was more consistent. And it felt like there was more of a, like there was, like priority. And that's the biggest thing you get because they were constantly moving. The film was constantly moving. It was there was a greater threat. That's the biggest thing I felt more than anything, uh, for the, the main push of the film right mm. uh 
Whedon, I, I guess what the, what the tone Whedon was trying to provide, it felt a little bit more lax, you know. It's almost like at the, I felt from the very beginning they were going to succeed because it wasn't as, it didn't feel important what, what was going on. You know what you 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 actually make a good point. I'm 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 thinking back over the original uh, Whedon cut with the Snyder cut, and I'm trying to remember how 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 I felt as the the sequences w- was going on and the the story was, was moving along. And yeah, you're right. Like it really wasn't all that. The the the, the, the it was a roller coaster in the Whedon's cut, but it was a very mild roller coaster. A lot of it felt yeah pretty pretty same. You had your your ramp ups, your ramp downs, but not that much variance. Wherein and and, and you can probably say it to, you know to give fairness to Snyder, he has four hours to do this, so we should have some very low lows, very high highs, and a nice amount of variance in between. Um, but yeah, yeah it's it, weird. Yeah, how can a two hour film film feel like people are slugging around, but the four hour one feels like it's you know, people care. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, look, I, I, I like Josh Sweden, jo- Josh mm. Sweden. Um, yeah. The only, t- the, the, I only have a bad souring, you know, image of him now only due to the comments made by Gal Gadot uh, and, and, and yeah. Ray Fisher. Um, and even mm. then, you know, I, I still give them some, some leeway into what this, the whole situation was, because I don't think it was Whedon's intent to completely uh-huh. like butcher the film. I think it was just yeah. he came in, WB said do this, and he went okay. Yeah. So I I agree. I think also with not entirely being his vision, it was it's really hard. I guess it was hard to really complete someone else's, but also trying to make it right in your own way. And you know, with Whedon, he's got he started. I mean, he'll always be credited for the Avengers films, the first two, which started everything. Yeah. Uh, so you can't ever take that away. But I just feel like there's just a whole bunch against it. I don't think it's anyone's fault. It's just really just almost a byproduct of the situation. Well, I mean, this, that was probably the best it could be. You know, I, and I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, and uh, I wonder if, if we're going to reach a bowling point in terms of creative visions and creative directions uh, battling with that of the studio interference. And I always want to say that it's because you know, Snyder up front right here with Warner Brothers and the issues that they had over the course of all, all of the movies post Man of Steel. But speaking of Whedon. If memory serves me correctly, there was a lot of information going around a few years after Age of Ultron and how he stated he had a lot of studio interference and a lot of issues. And I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe you made a statement saying that he did not want to work with Disney again after the the experience he had with Age of Ultron. I think. Again, don't quote me on it, but... I remember specifically he was complaining about the, the how they forced him to add in certain scenes like with Thor in that pool. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I, I didn't want to do that. And they, they, they told him, if you remove that scene, we'll force you to remove another scene that he really wanted to be in the movie. And so he was compromising. But I, mm-hmm. I, I remember specifically of that scene where they brought in Thor and he goes in the pool and lightning, he starts having a seizure and he starts seeing visions of the future and, and things. And it's like this came out of nowhere there was no build up to it and nothing ever really led into it again aside from you know a few movies later and even yeah. then very like, like not even that strongly tied and so mm-hmm. I, I, i'm curious as if we're going to see more directors start trying to stand up to studio interference and just go no let, let me do my thing so well i think um I mean, that, that's always really i think that's really just for the Films, the studios are like, we need this to be a guaranteed hit or else, you know, we lost all this money. And, you know, I, I think the first Avengers, he had a lot of leeway. Second one, I mean, you can even tell with Ultron, the, direct, the direction he was trying to go and the, the way they wanted to go. I mean, either way, I mean, I didn't mind, but I can tell it, it was supposed to be a lot darker. Yeah. Uh, but no, no, I think... Oh, and, and uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, and also sorry to kind of derail this to... to... Because it's not, it's like we're, we're, we're talking a bigger project or a bigger topic than just the DC stuff here. Yeah. I remember specifically the first time we get to see Ultron come on scene in a physical form. And, you know, he does the whole Pinocchio uh, yeah. statement. 
chills. Yeah. Complete and utter chills. And then like like 30, 40 minutes later, he's cracking crude jokes in an abandoned warehouse like he's some day of the week Disney, you know, uh, 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 Pete, like from Mickey Mouse, like Peter, uh, the, what is Pete's last name? Pete Pistol? Pete? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But you know, you know, Peg Lick Pete, you know, the, the, the giant dude that's always Mickey's nemesis. He's cracking like weird childish jokes. What happens to the, the menacing, you know, threatening, uh, uh, uh sorry. I, I, yeah. Uh, Age of Ultron started off so great to me, and it just kind of I think it did, out. yeah. Mm. Even the final sequence I felt was like, it didn't have the weight I think it needed to carry to me to actually care, because, I mean, but the first Avengers, I, I did, I was sort of, I sort of felt the same way, but you got a sense of how that team was built and how they function. That was the really the big highlight. And you wanted them to succeed, and they succeeded. So you're almost like rooting for them like you're rooting for like a boxer, you know, like a boxing film, to succeed. Yeah, where you can, where you're in that moment of, you know, their conflict and seeing if they come out of it. But yeah, I mean, Ultron. I, I, I mean, with like I was gonna say, with any big studio, that's always going to be the case, especially for projects they they really need to bank on. But a big like I just watched um, the the latest Godzilla film with my little brother, um, and the biggest thing I could say is it was. I feel like they had. The director had a lot of respect for the material, and also it didn't feel hindered. I think the biggest thing that was against it was the trailers, because honestly, the trailers not only gave too much away, but they repeated the same damn line: the "World <laughs> needs, <laughs> we need Kong. The world needs him." It's like, <laughs> why? It's not like they were trying to hide things. Like they gave away a whole bunch of crucial stuff in the trailers, but why? 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 sell it that short and why give out so much trailers but not only with the repeated lines but like key plot points or not key plot points but interesting plot points that were set up well if you watch the film but not in a trailer i just never understood that i can, I can see that and i i think your experience has coincided with what i i've been seeing online i i, I honestly have not seen um trailers for i saw like little teasers like we know the first original teaser and the little commercial where mm -hmm. you, you just see kong charging at godzilla yeah. um but i i saw a post online i think either i think it was on facebook and it was basically saying how people who because there are a few outlets that that's been reviewing uh godzilla versus kong uh, and saying, you know, the plot is, 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 is not deep enough. There's no real, and people were just like, it's a movie about giant kaiju yeah. fighting. Let's not pretend it's anything, anything more. And yeah. literally the only bad thing about it is they may have given too much of it away, but yeah. it's still a good mo monster movie fight. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, who cares about the humans? I think they did the humans right. Cause the humans direction coincided with the monsters. Like it wasn't so much there's a human story here, but the monsters are fighting. It's affecting this story. It's more like the humans move the plot so that certain things can be, you know, explored. Plus, you don't. It doesn't take too much of their time. The the plot for the humans really exposes the really just sets up the final battle. That's really its purpose. I was like, that works. I'm glad they did that as opposed to it's a father and son. You know, <laughs> they're trying to bond again. <laughs> Let, let, let me actually ask you real quick, and, and I, I love how this is branching off into like various mm -hmm. different tangents. If you don't know, mm -hmm. uh, After Dark is nothing but tangents. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, what what is what were or is if you remember um, at all your original thoughts of the first Michael Bay Transformers movie? I remember when I first saw it, I really liked it, and I still stand by it's a pretty good film. But over, it's a lot of it's sometimes a little too much, especially when it comes to tongue in cheek things. But I remember really liking it and thinking, you know, it's a solid film, but maybe a little too much of some stuff. Completely. The snow stuff kind of being like the lights, you know, the, the more visual stuff, maybe a little too much of that. But I think a pretty, pretty solid film in terms of what it was trying to deliver. I completely agree. And the reason why I ask is because I, I felt like Transformers, at least the first one and maybe the second one, was pretty much in the same boat that Godzilla and Kong is in now. And the fact that, oh, yeah. you know, and it, maybe a little bit better because the way that they, they opened the movie, you know, following Sam Witwicky, Shia LaBeouf, um, yep. 
felt nice the way they introduced Bumblebee, then later the other Autobots, and then it slowly focuses more ju just on the Autobots with a little bit of Sam in the background. Mm -hmm. And you know, great. It's, it's a great way to, to balance. And then you, get, you, I just get to see giant robot aliens fight. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Later Good movies, time. they started to try to do more of like the secret governments and the. Mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, Mark okay, Wahlberg. yeah. Now you're uh, you're, you're you're losing what was the the main th draw because you're you're focusing too much on the people and less of the Autobots and you mm -hmm. know. I still think they were they were fun movies, fun giant robot movies, but. Yeah, too much of the people at that point. Yeah, I will say for this film, the first shot is a kaiju. So oh, that's nice. That's there's no human build up. They go straight into it, and then they're like, "These are kaiju's." The humans, it kind of. I like how the humans kind of run the world, but they don't own it. The kaiju's are kind of a part. <laughs> of it. And that's actually a point in the film. Like the main guy. This is not really a spoiler. Well, it might be. The main guy's like, "I don't like kaiju's." Well, not a main <laughs> guy, but one of the guys. It's like, "I don't like kaiju's." We gotta stop them. It's in the trailers. Like we gotta stop Godzilla. Um, so that's the drive. The humans kind of drive the plot, but the characters are the monsters. They're the people. They're the ones we care about. They're the ones whose perspective we kind of see. The humans are just sort of. Well, we see the humans' perspective, but only in relation to the monsters, not their own dramas or, you know, you know, high school sucks. You know, <laughs> <laughs> can't get a can't get a, get a date for prom, and then oh shit, Godzilla's stepping on the school. <laughs> Like that, that actually might be a good one-off, like two-second little joke there. <laughs> that, it might be bad, but like I actually do enjoy like a little bit of that sprinkle. There's like two, two or three seconds, a quick, a quick little gag, and then right back to it. But that's just my own twisted uh, enjoyment of humor in places that it probably shouldn't be. Uh, There's a like, lot of um, like mute music humor, like with Kong. Like he's this is the opening scene, like. And spoilers, I guess, for anything we're talking about, I guess, is a, is a good <laughs> banner. But, like, there's a lot of Kong, like, swinging around. He's a monkey, so there's a lot of nice island songs that go with it. Or island kind of-esque songs that go with it. Kind of nice and jazzy. So I was like, that's some good. I mean, it makes sense. And he's, he's he has more of a character in this film. So giving him some light music to go with either him swinging or branches. Swinging on branches. Or just him... Being leisurely, mm -hmm. I mean, it worked. I felt because it's almost like the film kind of knows, it's like you know, it's a giant monkey. Let's put some fun music. <laughs> it's um, a giant gorilla. It's a giant gorilla, not a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. To be to be fair, there's a, yeah. It, I, I was gonna say I think most people would know or at least know the difference. And I remember, yeah, no, no, a lot of people actually don't. Yeah, but yeah, I, I I digress. Monkey has a tail. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah. I know that from the Kung Fu Panda memes. <laughs> well, are pandas no? Yeah, no, pandas are still they're considered apes, though. No, no, pandas are bears. What am I thinking? Oh, what, am I, what the hell am I thinking? Oh, uh, I'm just, oh, I'm just mentioning God. Kung Fu Panda, like the M monkey, the Ugwe monkey. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. yeah one. I, yeah. I don't. I just when you said uh, Kung Fu Panda, I don't know why I thought about Poe, and I was like, oh yeah, Poe's a gorilla. Wait. No, no, he's a, a panda, and the panda's yeah. a bear. Yeah, I, oh. I just had, I just had this whole spiel about people not knowing the difference between a monkey and a gorilla or an ape, and then I I sit here on the podcast in front of a camera, and I call a bear a monkey, a monkey, a gorilla, a gorilla, yeah, which is more acceptable, I guess, uh, <sighs> as a failure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, um. I was gonna. I was gonna mention in terms of like the the. I mentioned about like jokes sprinkled in and sprinkled out, and I remember specifically because I I remember watching Man of Steel in in the movie theaters for the first time, and mm -hmm. I I laughed at a scene during the fight between uh, Kal El and Zod, mm -hmm. and I remember Brother Blaine was like, "Why did you laugh?" Or someone asked me, "Why did I laugh?" And I said, "You didn't see the the small like one second gag." And he's like, "No." It's like, "Well, when when the Zod punches uh, Kal El or Superman into one of the the construction site buildings, he lands on a pole, and there's a number oh, of days yeah. since the accident. <laughs> and for like a split second, it resets the zero as the thing falls. And I, like, <laughs> I caught it. And I, it, it made me laugh. <laughs> I like there was a Wilhelm scream. I remember. Yes. That part. <laughs> 
Ah, the, it's the small things, man. The small <laughs> things are what I love. The small things are what I enjoy. It's, it's also, the, those those small things are where you're like, oh wow, that was brutal. Like when Namek like rips a dude's head off in, yeah! the, in the cockpit. When he was playing when the, in the plane. Like I was like, oh shit. Yeah. Like they, they it's the PG thirteen is for a split second you can miss it. But yeah, that Namek kind of like Namek like rips his head off. Like you can see the blood spatter as the plane is you know going down. I was like, oh wow. I didn't catch it the first time, but I was. I remember there's a video on YouTube that slowed it down and said, "Oh, look at that, beheaded." It's 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 it's, and I I I get it. Not everybody thinks that a superhero movie can have gruesome scenes like that. But I'm 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 sorry. Yeah, if I see a lot, loves the boys. Everyone loves the boys, though. <laughs> oh, oh, right. And I, you know, and people say, "Oh, well, it's it's literally built to be uh, sarcastic and a parody on the actual superhero drama." I, I get that. I, I, true, but the point still stands. If you can want super powered beings do some bloody things in the movie. Then that can really apply to anything. There, there is no law or theory or theorem that states because you know superhero movies cannot have so and so. And I'm sorry, especially when it comes to literally Kryptonians yep. in a city, like uh, 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 three of them who were literally bred for war, and then one who just kind of started accepting who he is as a Kryptonian. Mm-hmm. Things are gonna get messy. I, I, yeah. I, I uh, that's just. Yeah, I think there's also a kind of it didn't make me laugh, but I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Was uh, when Kalal was uh, when General Zod like threw a uh, truck. I think it was a Lex Luthor, um, like oil rig. Maybe that was that. Maybe it was Lex Luthor. I remember seeing that in War Justice League War, but maybe it's not. It's a different truck. But after <laughs> when um, like Superman just casually like jumps over it, but then he looks behind him and, and it explodes. And he's like, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. He <laughs> was like, shit. <laughs> Uh, I guess that's what trucks do against buildings. He was like looking at it <laughs> for a second. I was like, "Fights there, my dude." It's like, no, but look at that. He was like, "Like, oh damn, I messed up." <laughs> yeah, oh, and 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 that's actually a, a a really big point. I think was a part of the message of Man of Steel. Mm-hmm. He's new. He's yeah. not. He's not all star yet. He's yeah. going to make mistakes. I don't. See, uh, here, here's the thing. I, I, I get people want the perfect Superman, the all-star, the never makes mistakes, the that can do everything. But when you want that, and when you get that, a la Superman Returns, mm-hmm. you kind of get a boring movie. Oh, yeah. And you know, with Superman Returns, that wasn't even all-star. That was like Christopher Reeves, but just the just the happy moments. Yeah. But it's actually... Pretty much, Christopher Reeve hardly ever punched because I think the biggest thing with Superman is if he punches somebody, they're dead. Yep, flat out. So you need someone that level. But I mean, if it's like a Kevin Spacey slash Gene Hackman, Lex Luthor, he's not going to punch him. Um, this just goes against his morals. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe more, maybe instead of punching things, maybe throw things, maybe lifting more things. I mean, he did, there's some excellent sequences of the plane and stuff, but. But it doesn't. The setup for that film really doesn't have a payoff if you can't be physical. I mean, the point of Superman is, like, when he when he actually fights, like, things explode. That's really that's the point. And I don't think in any, I can't remember in any Christopher Reeves movie besides the second one, where he gets violent, like he breaks Sod's hand, mm-hmm. but he he rarely. I and mean, then there's I think Superman four. He fights himself. Um, or that's Superman three. I forget. Which, I mean, those those two. I don't remember really remember anything so then the, the, the <laughs> four was you know the the nail polish uh electro man or radioactive man i forget yeah. the name yeah they yeah. fought but you see how they fought it was a bad movie <laughs> yeah as well so it's like you can't win with this yeah you know i also I, I remember the conversation when it came to superman versus zod and he breaks his wrist and throws him down the 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 kareen right and people are just like, oh, did he just kill Zod? And I believe in the theatrical re- release, yeah, he essentially just killed Zod. Yeah. But I believe in one of the either the VHS release or something or extra cut, uh, mm-hmm. they cut to like like the police being there and walking well, Zod out in handcuffs. Like why? They just break out that maybe they were exposed. Oh, maybe yeah. In that final scene, I think uh, they had the reversed. Oh uh, yeah, the power. Reversed. Yeah, so now they're now they're that's how he can break his hand now because yeah. he's human now. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, but that's not canon though. The canon right. is he drops down, he's dead. Yes, and or he's still falling. 
Yep. Unless, yeah, dead. I mean, at that, at that point, I mean, it's still, still one way or another, he's going to die of old age, even if it takes forever. I, I don't know. Maybe but, there's like a rancor, like on the side level, that just snaps <laughs> him up. But I, I just remember like that whole concept of being like, you know, Superman has never killed in any movie before. It's like, yeah, he has. He has. Oh, but it's just subtle. That's like yeah. Batman in the Nolan series. Like he definitely killed Ra's al Ghul and yeah. the daughter. Yeah. And, and Bane, like, technically. It, well, oh. he was a, a Catwoman did it, but he, he did the layup, right? I mean, he set up the layup. <laughs> Well, uh, one of the biggest arguments that people had against Ben Affleck and B, or sorry, Batfleck and BVS was um, it, it, not even just about the killing. People were pissed about the branding. Just like, oh, you know, he brands criminals, let them go to jail, and then you know, other prisoners will kill them in jail for having the brand. And I'm like, okay, yep. so, and it's like, yeah, but so that that's killing indirectly. And it's like, previous Batman has, has done it. No, uh, no, okay. Batman has. Oh. Keaton flat out kill, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keaton was a distant man. But and it was like yeah, Happy Meals was the equivalent <laughs> of killing. Right? He did it with wearing a smile. It was a happy. It was like exciting for him. It was. It was. I, it was almost like a cruel joke. I mean, um, him and Joker have a lot. That I feel like after he met Jack Nicholson's Joker, like he really was like, all right, we can we can be we can be a little bit more brutal <laughs> yeah but yeah then, i will say too um with the branding i always thought like it was like batman like really just going i don't see people in these in in criminals like they're like cattle to me if i'll brand them make sure they don't do it again and if i see them on the street i can easily identify them probably cripple them put them in the hospital but i put in a place that i mean i mean there's almost some sympathy there i guess where i mean if they wear enough clothes they can cover it but they wear a t-shirt <laughs> i know it's them I know it's them. Man, but see, like, if, 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 and, and uh, I'm going to have a future video, I promise, of when I go through, like, my entire DCEU slate that I would do. But mm. I, I would actually have that have been um, story elements seeding future Batman films, like so solo Batman films or Bat Family mm. films. Because, like, uh, imagine a Nightwing movie, right? Mm -hmm. And he starts noticing that there are particular groups of criminals who are, like, uh, teaming up into, like, large groups. Not, not, not quite a syndicate, but specific uh, criminals. And it turns out criminals who were branded by Batman, you know, are trying to seek revenge. And, you know, one of the key elements that you figure out what's going on is like if, if Nightwing you know, fights one, beats him up and then like sees he's branded and it will tie back into the BVS brandings, man. But I think um, it'd be cool too, like uh, if like they utilize that the Bat brander, I guess the Batarang, Bat Pod, Bat Brander, I guess that's the way you call it. Like they, like I guess the Sons of Batman. Like for marking new members, they actually put that on their face, and then you sort of get that face. You sort of get that harder interpretation of Frank Miller's um, novel, where they just paint their face, but they actually brand their face with the with the thing with the with that thing. Dude, Maybe that, that'd be an interesting topic. That, that would or, be or interesting. Yo, yo, that that would actually be a really good movie, in my opinion. Like, um, and then you see them scream, ah, ah, but then they're happy afterwards. Like, yeah. <laughs> can you imagine the Bat Family? Nightwing, Batgirl, you know, uh, Robin, uh, mm -hmm. Red Robin, uh, Red Hood, uh, fighting against a literal like, massive army of crazy militia people who are who think you know who are doing it to, to be like Batman. And also, if you saw in the Snyder Cut, like there, are, Batman was rounding up mutants with his uh, bat tank the, from the graphic novel. There's some mutants that were rounded up in the middle. They had yeah. the visors. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I need to go back and actually see that thing because I saw that and I thought they, because I, I assumed they were parademons, like leftover parademons, but I saw that they looked weird. They're too skinny. It's like, yeah. yeah Dark Knight, yeah. Dark, Dark Side been uh, putting them on Nutrigrain. Nutrigrain. Or, oh, yeah. man, that would have been awesome. That, oh, um, yo, oh, that could tie in so well with, um, because you heard about the the leaked yeah. com information from Joe Manga Manganello, right? Oh, if, he, if they do a Deathstroke, like, why don't they do, like, instead of Superman hunting Batman, it's Deathstroke. And they do, like, a, well, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound actually... They can do so much more. That was just an idea I just came up with. <laughs> but like, I do want like almost like an Arkham Origins, uh, like Deathstroke. You know, we have a vendetta. I don't like you, but I, I like the idea that the criminals are there's like almost like a hunt for Batman now. 
Yeah. Kind of like Birds of Prey, but a little bit more integrated. And then Deathstroke actually has some personal business. So it's like Lex Luthor's like, all right, we this is Batman is Bruce Wayne. That's how I mean. I feel like if if we like for that, like almost like I feel like there's no secret identity. But like Lex Luthor knows, he'll just say to the criminals, "Here's Batman's identity," because he already did that to Slade, right? Why not just do that with every criminal? He's probably gonna do that anyways. Yeah. And just go whoever should kill him. Like, do the, basically, he'll do the same thing he did with Superman, but actually say, this is what he should have done in the beginning. Like, if you kill him, I'll give you a billion dollars. First one who kills him gives, gives me the head, billion dollars. Here's his name. Instead of being indirect, he just goes, just kill him. And then, uh, you know, you'll get you'll get your billion. And with Slate, it's like, it's personal. You keep the money. <laughs> <laughs> Something uh... like that. I, I, I don't think you're far off from what they were trying to do because Joe Manganiello gave an interview where he talked about uh, Ben Affleck's Batman script. And that was that was kind of it. And then um, Joker, we probably went to Joker is like, now why'd you do that? Why'd you tell that script? <laughs> Again, uh, part, uh, hinted at the whole bit about how uh, Lex told him, um, was it, you know, I lost a clown or I, I'm a short few certain clowns. Mm-hmm. It's oh, hinted yeah. that he went to Joker first, and whatever you know they tried to do did not go well. So he, you know, it fell through, and so he went to Deathstroke. Oh, maybe. Well, maybe this is it. Maybe it's not. Maybe. Uh, I was gonna. This is kind of a reach because it doesn't make sense chronologically. But it was like the. Actually, this doesn't make any sense at all. I was gonna say that Lex Luthor gave secret identity to the Joker. That's how he got to Robin. But if you saw the. Snyder cut. It seems like Batman sent Robin yeah. to do like a mission, and then it didn't work out. Yeah, that's why I, I I really want to see the uh, the Ayer cut. I know they say mm-hmm. they're not going to do it. I I think they'd be stupid not to do it. I think it's a, it's an easy win financially and uh, yeah. p- publicity wise. But because we know that uh, Harley Quinn was there and aided in the killing of Robin. Um, I, I know rumors speculated that originally they wanted it to be Dick Grayson, but I, I've I've read rumors that during the <clears throat> planning they decided to go with Jason Todd for that. I hope that yep. was true, and I, I want Air Cut to lead into more of what happened there. Uh, but ah, uh... yeah, I still like the idea that it was actually the Joker we saw was actually like a transformed Robin, like they did with uh, Return of the Joker and Batman Beyond. Mm-hmm. But I can accept that because I thought maybe the Joker in this was a, maybe a little bit more seasoned. Mm. Well, maybe like in, in the Jared Leto, I know is like a vampire literally now because of <laughs> age. But I, I was expecting, yeah, I think Jared Leto is is nearing forties. Yes, so he's the right age, but he just looks like in his twenties. I mean, I guess I guess that that's sort of how how he sells it too. It's like, yeah, I might look naive, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm you know. Very menacing. That's kind of how he sold it in that film, in parts. But then you get some weird scenes as well. Hong yeah. Kong, because the <laughs> you know, it, it, that's why I I, I think because uh, I I I really want to see more of Leto's Joker. I I don't I think it was I think it was a great portrayal. Of, but we saw not we didn't see the best parts. We just saw the acceptable parts. But there was some there was some there was a lot of potential. It just wasn't realized. Yeah. Because off off the jump, you are told you know a few major key things about the Joker in this world. One, he's immensely powerful via his connections and, and equipment and, and, and how far his criminal empire reaches. Because literally, to be able to have that much you know hardware, that many uh, I'm saying servants, uh, minions, and then mm-hmm. to be able to kidnap a uh, a, a guard of a high security held prison. And then later, easily break into said secret government high guarded prison and do a breakout. Like, you got to have some real skill and power to do that. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I don't know where the the air timeline, the Suicide Squad fits in the timeline. I know it's directly after Superman dies. Mm -hmm. Um, Then it wouldn't make sense either. Because I was thinking, like, the suit he wears at the end of Suicide Squad is very similar to the suit he wears at the end of the Snyder Cut, like that SWAT uniform. So I was thinking mm-hmm. like maybe like weeks afterwards or maybe the like close to that, the end of that film, that's when all the dark side stuff happened. And he's like still reminiscing, you know, about Harley. He wears that suit to remind him of, you know, that great moment before everything went to shit. Yeah. 
Huh. But yeah, we I think I think we know that Justice League happens like a little while afterwards, like years years go by before Superman comes back. Mm. But I guess it was fun to think about for a second. Yeah, I I just the the the, the main draw for the entirety of Suicide Squad for me was a single line or or I guess lines that Bruce gave to Amanda Waller. Yeah, he was like shut it down, or me and my friends will. And because mm-hmm. this delete does not yet exist, I can only assume he means Oracle and some other types of Robins, Red Robins, or or etc. So, I, I just thought he was after watching Justice League, it was like super friends. That's what I meant by friends. <laughs> but I don't know because I, I I I assume at, you know the timeline for uh, Suicide Squad is after BVS and before Justice League, so I don't think he has the team. Yeah, he does like, at all. Yeah. I mean, maybe Wonder Woman at that time, but that's probably uh, I think about it, it. That's just friend. Yeah, you well, we don't even know if they're even. Friends like it's at just that point. well, we we fought once doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. But so. um, I don't. Th- yeah, I I think I don't know. I think with with all these films, there's there don't, there's some non linearity, so that could lead into one thing we'll never know. Obviously, honestly, I think they'll just retcon it and say, "Yeah, it's the Justice League." <laughs> I, yeah, I really hope they don't. Though, I, I, I mean, even even if they don't want to do like a Bat Family type of thing, like I mean, you can make it all, all be so many more things without it trying to screw over what is already said. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm also so very salty because mm-hmm. they set up so much potential or what they could do with it they, you know J- snyder cut had freaking the the atom in it oh yeah i didn't i didn't even catch that the first time i thought yeah. he was gonna end up being a villain maybe maybe get manipulated by steppenwolf but no he's i forget adam's uh code name or real name but yeah he's the scientist working with uh silas yes and I, I, I believe technically he's the third adam in the dc continuity um, so they, they they skipped the first two, and that you know that's, that's fine. The Adam isn't that popular. I do yeah. feel a bit weird if you're gonna go with one of the next set of um, uh, superhero characters. But I mean, they're doing the same thing with Blue Beetle by going straight to Jaime. Mm-hmm. Rive- uh, is it Jaime Rivera? Yeah, the, the Injustice one. Yes. Yeah, but they did that with Flash. Like they went with Barry Barry Allen, not uh, Wally West. It was Barry no. Allen the second? No, I think there was. Barry Allen is the first uh, post the Silver Age universe. Yeah, Te- Silver te- Age. Yeah. Technically, yeah. the first is uh, what's his name? You know, uh, I think with the hat. Yes, <laughs> with the hat. <laughs> then it's Barry. Then it's, and Wally, then it's Wally. And then it's um, uh, shoot, what is his name? I think there was uh, one before the, the 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 newest Wally. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, let me see. I, I do like the new Wally though, the the black Wally. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna think. Like like the um, Young Justice, I guess. Let me see. Ranking all the Flash. No, just give me this. I just want. I just want the Flashes. I just want. So yeah, Jay Garrick is technically the very first Flash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have Jay like, Garrick. Yeah. Uh, Wallace West is, is is the black Wally. Wallace West, he's mm-hmm. fourth or fifth. Mm-hmm. Bart Allen. I think Bart Allen was the one I was thinking of that comes after Wall. Uh, uh, Adult Wally West. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. 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 But um. Well, with, the, with Flash though, um, as a character, I feel like. Do, we, do you ever think it will get to the point where it's like the adult crime investigator kind of? I, I would love to see a Flash where he gets really inspired in a way by Batman and kind of joins the police force. Kind of like they kind of alluded to that a bit, or kind of have a bit of that in the Flashpoint movie mm-hmm. before he got his powers. Kind of like that kind of relationship where it's like he was maybe in the GCPD, but then he had these powers. I mean, you, I mean, I like the idea of of a setup to something bigger. Like I was going to mention earlier, I always liked the idea of Superman being almost like this ageless, infinitely old superhero that when Bruce Wayne was a child, he looked up to Superman instead of Zorro, maybe, in this interpretation. And he models the bat symbol on his chest based on Superman, because it makes sense for Superman to have it because it's his people. But the opposite is kind of strange, because like, oh, they had a symbol and Krypton so happened to have it on Earth. But for Bruce Wayne to be inspired to have a symbol by Superman, 
like when he was not only as a kid. Well, that'd be cool if as a kid because that explained that'll explain a lot. I mean the <laughs> the, the gray mask, which I think is the animated version of his inspiration, and Zoro is okay, but I, I it really really doesn't answer how he got that iconography. I feel like if, if he got the iconography for Superman, that'd be so cool. So everything fits, and then he just added more stuff to customize, you know, based on his ninja training and also his idea of his given identity. I always like the younger Batman looking up to like a almost like a Kingdom Come Superman. I actually think that would be a really cool take on a story, be it an Elseworlds or or uh, uh, one of the, like the the day one type of stories. Mm-hmm. That's actually really interesting, I mean, in my opinion. They actually did something quite cool in the Superman. Like I call it the Rebirth movies because they're they all seem like they're connected. They have a new style. Uh, Superman uh, was it Man of Tomorrow, where Martha Kent makes his suit, and he said he got the inspiration. She got the inspiration from Batman. You see <laughs> Batman in the so while Clark's like young, he's like, oh, that's shit, that's Batman. And you see a glimpse of him in the newspapers, and it was inspired. His suit was inspired by that. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. It makes sense because Martha Kent made it, but if it was from Krypton, that's like, all right, it's two, two <laughs> coincidences too much for me. Yeah. That's actually one thing I, I wish they did in Man of Steel. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I like the type of connection that Superman has with his mom in the comics because in the comics, Martha did make his suit. Um, but also his cape is the fabric that he was wrapped in as a baby when his mm-hmm. ship landed on Earth. So what I would have preferred in Man of Steel would be that the actual suit is Kryptonian suit, like the family suits yeah, and other stuff. I think I think that's what they did in re- that that movie because I think there's a scene where he's like, I can't remember, but like he's he's flying with the suit and like it burns off because it's like earthly materials. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she I think she used um, I, at least the cape was a part of the um, stuff from the ship. Yeah, but I can understand. I mean, Snyder, um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more alien. I mean, it feels extraterrestrial. It's more technology based. Yeah, that's, to... that's, 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 that's like what I'm going at. That I, I wanted the suit. I mean, I, I want everything to have been Kryptonian, but I wanted the suit to be something that was already adult size and established in the ship. But the cape would have been what yeah. he was wrapped in, and we should have got a scene where we saw Martha actually put the cape on the suit to to complete it. I don't. I don't like the idea that all Kryptonians just have capes with their their suits. It's not a bad idea. I just kind of find it weird that all of their suits <laughs> just have capes attached to it. Yeah, I mean that's that's such an interesting point. But I mean, if you look at Zod, maybe it's just the the Regal. I mean, I don't. I don't consider um, Jor El in that film. He's just he was also a scientist yeah, in point. a way. Yeah. But Zod didn't have it. All the all the Hifaor didn't have it. Namek didn't have it. Like all the. People that got transported in those penis ships didn't no. have it. <laughs> no, I, I think I think Fer- Ferrard actually did. If I'm not, oh, let me. Man of Steel. Only only when coming to Earth, she had adorned that you know. Yeah. That Giger esque uh, engineer suit. Which I, that's what I call those suits that they wore. Yeah, yeah it, it 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 does look a lot like the um, the cor- the navigator. Space jockey. Space jockey. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, they're, so good. they used to be called Space Chuck, you know, they're engineers. Engineers, okay. I mean, Aliens is a whole other thing. That's another series I love, but it's just been brutally massacred, but also kind of respectful at the same time. It's, it's a weird, it's a weird dynamic. So that's another, like, I love, like, I feel like Aliens, you know, Jurassic Park, all these films, childhood, right? Or Aliens, more teenage years. <laughs> but they've, they've had their goods and their bads. And there's not been that, like, all good or all bad is just a weird toxic relationship I have with those franchises. Terminator, <laughs> no, that's mostly not bad. <laughs> Rambo is one that is that's something I know is way off topic. It's different where people say it's bad, but I still love every single one of them. That's I guess it's because of the, the character itself and the story's kind of are almost secondary. I just like seeing the character, but at least they're like personal opinion. I love all of them. Like yeah. they strike an emotional chord. Rocky too. But there's no, there hasn't been really a bad Rocky film besides the fifth one. Even that was good too. It was, but it was just too depressing and like it's almost like it wasn't a bad film, but it felt like, like it's like getting a bad beat. That's what it feels like. Like, mm. like it's just a letdown. Like your favorite team losing. That's just what it felt like. <laughs> not a, not a bad match though. <laughs> but yeah. they, they played their heart out. I, I feel the same way about. Um... 
one of my favorite childhood movies, uh, Fifth Element. I, I do not think that movie is, is a good movie, but I think it's like fantastic at what it tries to be. And I think it's very fun and I have, it has a soft place in my heart, you know? Um, that's yeah, I wasn't allowed to watch that movie as a kid. Really? <laughs> the main lady. Ah, I forgot about the suit, yeah. Uh, that's, the, that's the only thing. I, when he said that, I was like, why couldn't I watch this? And I was like, oh, I remember. Have, have you seen it since, though? I think I've seen it once on TBS. Okay. Uh, or I'm not sure if you had this um, here. Like, Peach Street TV used to play movies. Yeah. yeah that was the thing. <laughs> that's, when I, that's when I watched Scary Movie 3 for the first time. I thought it was The Exorcist. I was like, this isn't scary. Wait, wait, wait. Is Scary Movie the funny version of it or the real actual screen? No, no, uh, Scary Movie Three is the parody. I thought yes, because yes, there was a yes. scene with the with the Exorcist, and I thought, wait, this is what people are scared of. <laughs> this isn't scary. Why is there aliens in this film? <laughs> no, no, no. The the bit where the aliens are like are like choking everybody, and yeah, like they put their finger in people's mouths, and just like, and then someone's like, oh no, that's how we pee, <laughs> and you realize like he's like, putting his finger in people's <laughs> mouths. <laughs> And then, like, the cocking of the shovel, and then, like, <laughs> knocking the... I'm sorry. I am a big fan of the Scary Movie franchise. I, 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 I really think they're am. funny. Yeah. I didn't I didn't watch 4, um, just because, like, I mean, I might I might get back get into it again, but I just... The first three was what they played on TV, and the fourth one really was in theaters when I was growing up, so I didn't put it on TV yet. But, yeah, I think they were... Growing up, they are very funny. A little too raunchy in tight times, but I feel, like, mostly funny. Let me ask you real quick though. Did you recognize that the character played by Kevin Hart was 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 Kevin Hart? That's the you know that the the actor, comedian. Oh, he was playing. Yeah, I re- I knew it was him. I mean, I know the the um the the, the his, his friend. Yeah, the guy with the reds, Anthony Anderson. Yes, dude. For years, I had never realized that that was Kevin Hart. For years, until first I was like, time I saw Kevin Hart, I was like, oh, that's the guy from Scream Movie Three. <laughs> Like the fact that they go all the way back for, like, for every single movie, and it's, it, 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 it's, I don't know, like, cause I, I don't know when Kevin Hart really got popular, when he, you know, got to his peak career as a comedian. But I know it was much after Scary Movie One and Two, or at least after Scary Movie One. And so, like, yeah. I, I legitimately wonder, like, I, the, the, the story behind his career growth, going from Scary Movie, a normal stomach set of comedian, to becoming one of the, the most iconic of the, the time. Uh, uh, comedians, he, he, like he, he really worked his ass off. He, I don't think he realized he was in Forty Year Old Version as well. Who was he in Forty Year Old Version? Yeah, he was in. I think he was in that film with the Steve Carell. Yeah, I don't like. I can't remember like what, what scene he was in or like who he played. I'm pretty sure he was in that. I remember him. Could be. I, I believe so. I also know he was in. He was in Grudge Match with Stallone and De Niro. Yes, I remember that one. That was pretty funny. I was expecting it to be serious because it was like Rocky versus Raging Bull, but <laughs> I mean, they're, they're they have I mean they have they're old. Not going to say they're old because shit, they're they're killing it, right? They yeah. make us look bad, but yeah. they're not in their prime. I say, but if they made that film maybe thirty years ago, I mean, it would be one of the best boxing films like ever. I think maybe Scorsese directed it, like he did with Raging Bull. Mm-hmm. Which, funny enough, if you if I remember reading that. The only reason why they greenlit Raging Bull is because they had to. There was some agreement that Rocky Two also had to come out as well, which gave the opportunity for Scorsese to direct Raging Bull. Interesting. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of cool stuff, um, especially with that first Rocky. I mean, I know all about the Rocky, and well, not all, but a lot about the Rocky and Rambo series because that was basically high school. Like the Stallone, he he might have wrote it, wrote it, written it, starred in it, but originally. Um, the reason why the film was greenlit was because execs were watching it and they thought that Perry King, uh, because they said Sloan's in this film, Lords of Flatbush, and there's no internet. So they thought that the main character from that was going to play Rocky. So it's like, oh, yeah, we'll greenlight it. But then it's like, oh, no, it's Stallone. Wait, <laughs> cut the budget. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. That's, man, that's some interesting like movie trivia and just history in general. Oh, I think I told you about the the um the taxi driver um Quinn Tarantino story. Yeah. Um, that's some crazy stuff. If that's true, then like that is scary. That's yeah. Scary. But uh, I believe it. 
Oh yeah, dude. Like you know, you, you live long enough, you 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 see some 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 some, some things. And Do you want to remind the audience what that story is? I will let you take it away. So basically, um, just to make it short, I, I remember I embellished it for Zane just because I was building it up. But in an interview with Quentin Tarantino, like there was this uh, legend he talked about about how um, originally uh, with the uh, Scorsese's Taxi Driver. Uh, there was when the studio first saw it, they said it was way too bloody and that it wouldn't they would basically give the film an NC seventeen, which means no one would see it. And really the only films that were that rating were the you know, the public porn theater movies. So it would be <laughs> relegated to that. And think of I mean if you think about it, this was in the same I mean, Taxi Driver was the same year the cover released the same year as Rocky. I mean Rocky made Best Picture, Taxi Driver was in the running, so it was that caliber of film. And the director was so furious. I don't think the film was done. It was just the dailies were being sold and were being watched. And just the movie up to that point, he was so furious. He was planning on contemplating on killing one of the people. I think one of the executives that said that they were going to do this mostly out of like, he worked so hard on this film and just to have it thrown away, he was just pissed. And while he was going to do the deed, he got an idea for the film. I mean, he got an idea that, you know, why not? He could just change the color grading, and that that might solve the issues, and it did eventually. But the remainder of the film, the sort of psychological descent, was influenced a lot by that, by that feeling he had of trying to of wanting to really kill somebody, and that's sort of where Robert De Niro's character went in the film. I wonder. Very very scary thought. That's a that. I mean, you think about back then how they they really. We're a little bit more fair with directors with creativity, but not so much when it came to this is the way to do it. I mean, is this or nothing? So I mean, it's a lot of stress, and especially with indie films. I don't. At the time, it was lower, lower budget than most films, but uh, still, just that idea of we could, we could take it away because we're the studios. <laughs> I mean, you 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 saw with the Snyder Cut how you know if studios do that, they'll get checked eventually. There's some justice in. Speaking about Justice League, there's some justice in the filmmaking process again. But back then, like no one cares. Like if, if we're gonna release what we did, it's our movie anyways. Yeah. So you got you got that a lot. So just to hear those stories, it's like what kind of time that was. No internet, no communications, you just get told that. You can't tell anybody. The press, you know, you know the press only wants to sell the stories that make them look good and I mean, you never know who's in the pocket of big business. Yeah. No outlets, you know. It's, this is a pretty, like, low, like, you know, feeling and kind of world. So it's, it's great to see where we've come, but it's still very scary to look at back then as a filmmaker and as an artist, what what kind of, if you're not on their side, what, they're, what they can do. You know, they say that, like, being blackballed in Hollywood is, is, is literally, like, the, the only real threat of being blacklisted, uh, not really the only, but one of the one of the only uh, careers where that's actually doable. You know, mm-hmm. you can get business outside of Hollywood, but if you want to make the big bucks in the big business, like the whole career industry, it's mm-hmm. really tightly, closely knitted. And I mean, I guess we saw that firsthand with the whole like, um, uh, Wein- is it, uh, Weinstein. Weinstein, yeah. yeah. So I mean, it, yeah, it'll be it'll it'll, it'll be a- interesting to see how things adapt in the future. <laughs> That's a topic that, you know, we go in tangents, but it's something to save, I guess. But we're, you know, <laughs> yeah, a pretty heavy topic. Yeah. And we are already approaching the oh, actually how? 20 minutes to 11 or 20 till if we want to use the shortened language. Yeah. Are you feeling like we, we should go ahead and wrap it up or you want to go like one or one or two more topics? I think we should go back to talking about the Snyder Cut. We just spent like <laughs> one sentence about Batman and then Superman's suit. And then it's like, oh, by the way, uh, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, uh, Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I don't also, know. I guess this can also be a recurring thing. But uh, I feel like if tangents are a thing, we could just talk about another aspect of Snyder's universe and then we'll go off to something else. I was not planning on talking about Taxi Driver or Rocky because those are things I would like. I love to talk about, but I was expecting it. So, 
Hey, I mean, yeah, dude, I'm I'm down for making it a regular thing. It doesn't have to be every mm-hmm. month. You know, we we do rotations of of mm-hmm. co-hosts. We can always just bring you in on a one of those mm-hmm. rotations again. It, it'd be fine. I, I will mm-hmm. say though, you bring up like the whole bit about some more Schneider movies. I am a massive fan of Legends of Gaul. Was that the Owl film? Yes. Oh man, I never saw that. I think as growing up, I just um, was that Zack was that Zack Snyder? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. 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 I, you know, at Math, um, oh, man. Uh, you know, no, I'll, I'll say it for another day. I, I want to get into a, a bit of a topic discussion about, like, the character of Zack Snyder. Not, like, a fake Zack Snyder, but more of, like, his, his influence and what he tries to do when the the statements made by people who have worked with them as either yeah. like partners, uh, staff, actual actors and actresses. There, there's been a very solid mm-hmm. common line. And I would love to get into that one day. Like, yeah, I mean, about it. just uh, from my perspective, yeah, I mean, looking at, into kind of him, him as a, not only just a person, but as a director, like there's only good stuff. Like he's adopted so many children. He has a big family, a big heart. I mean, you hear from everyone that works on set with him. He tries to, he strives to make a balanced work environment, a good work environment. No one has anything bad to say. He's really, he's like, in a way, like our Carlos. Yeah. But for filmmaking, yeah, he, he sort of ha- he has all the solutions. He's there to help, but doesn't doesn't really push like studios, executives push, and how Whedon, um, purportedly, and this is not just him, it's Jeff Johns and everyone else on that project, push, you know, everyone for no reason, just for deadlines and for I mean, whatever they needed. Which again, it's like, what was the point at the end of the day? Yeah, but yeah, that's all you hear. That's all. That's all, only good stuff. And I think it shows a lot about him as a person and kind of why you get such a deeper, uh, I guess, breadth of characters and their development through his films. But yeah, this is the only, only good stuff from what I've heard and, and read regarding him. And yeah. I just seeing interviews, you can tell he's a good guy. And he, he takes the time to addressing all his fans even on youtube yeah dude that yeah. that shocked me that shocked yeah. me he actually uh at, at some type of call or, or not call uh a conference a few years back he was doing a um, uh, uh what do you call it when, you, when you're hosting a uh a panel panel yeah and uh, apparently he looked under the audience and just like yeah I, I i know those two guys in there and he was talking about i, f- I forget the youtube channel it's, it's two guys that always like talking about movies and real rejects no i don't think so not real rejects. reaction no. He was on Tyro Magnus. I was like, yo, <laughs> yeah, yo, <dude. laughs> shocked the hell out of me. I was like, yo, the dude who went on and on and on about how Zach knows how to do a cape flap. He knows capes. Yeah, he, Zach is the master of slow motion, whatever that slow motion is. Oh yeah, but I did not yeah, expect I, to be on that man's show. It was, I mean, it was a short interview, but like, damn, Tyro Magnus. He oh. he 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 got there. <laughs> he did. Man, that was that was that was pretty cool. I didn't I didn't expect that. It was for Snyder Cut too, so it was like it was good. <laughs> <laughs> also, like Grace ran off as well. Uh, he, I think he 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 did the bigger YouTube channels that are specific to like Geekdom and the comic book community, but just also the reaction channel. That's very <laughs> telling. Like he pays attention to his fans. Like that's what these films feel like. He pays attention. Mm. And each one gets better, and then you get honestly the best, I guess, film. I can, I, the best DC Extending Universe film for sure. I was thinking Shazam, but like if you look at Justice League, it's a lot more, it's just, it's just a lot more good stuff. I mean, Shazam works as a film entire, uh, in and of itself entirely, but still, you can't, I, I, I still, I guess it might be just raw motions, but I can't, I can't think of any other DC film that has that impact that Snyder's Justice League had. Oh, yeah. And and, and, and to that credit, I, I think him doing, you know, the previous movies led up to him being able to fine-tune and just get better as he as he goes. Because before before just uh, Snyder cuts Justice League, uh, I will say Man of Steel was my favorite DCEU film. Um, I did say, I was going to say Shazam just because it was, it, it had the perfect balance. Yeah. I really love that film, though. It was Christmas time, you know, sucker for holidays. 
but it it, it, it was a good storytelling. It was a good close film. BVS, I'm gonna have an interesting relationship with it because with that I can't really watch it a lot because of how long it is. Fair. That's the thing. But I mean, I, I did feel like in parts like it's almost like I got consumed by the negative feedback. It's almost like peer pressure into thinking, you know. Do I remember it right? Almost doubting myself as to because when I remember when me when I first watched it, me and my friend watched it, and uh, we literally, I, I was gonna drop him off before, or actually I think he drove. I can't remember exactly what it was. I don't know. I, I, I yeah, he dropped me off. He picked, he said, "I'll pick you up and watch it." And we literally walked around the neighborhood for like an hour, just like, "Yo, it's so awesome!" We're just like, <laughs> "It's like, damn, that was a good film." And then the next day we get all this like 33 percent what what happened this isn't right like maybe only two people reviewed it it's like so yeah there's so there's just almost like this weird relationship now just with kind of the social sphere influencing almost in a way kind of whether it's right or not to like that kind of film yeah which is a, a big thing but yeah i don't care for justice league like that's i, I sort of am a little older i mean not about that much but I, I can say, you know, there's nothing. Impl- and I saw some uh, reviews or like criticisms about like the plot. And I'm like, that kind of makes sense, but you know, I don't care. Yeah. It, I, I, but, I, I think the reviews and the, and the critiques that I've seen in terms of the Snyder Cut has been a, a far more grounded and far more actual criticisms. Because <laughs> I remember specifically with Men of Steel and BVS, and don't get me wrong, they, they, there were legitimate criticisms, you know, in, in, in those movies as, as well for the reviews. But what I saw a majority of across actual reviews from quote unquote official critics on Rotten Tomatoes, as well as people on YouTube, you know, people online, it was literally this is a bad movie because character X shouldn't be doing this, or character X should not be shown in in, in this uh th- this, this color grading, or you know, a character saying this is what ruined the movie for me. And don't get me wrong. I think everyone is, is entitled to their opinions. And if that ruined their experience for them, completely valid. But that does not make the film itself a bad film. You know, if you if you critique the pacing, the interconnectivity of certain uh, plot points, those are legitimate cr- critiques. You saying the movie is bad because Superman's cape wasn't red enough. Uh, okay, sure. Or, 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 all right. All uh, right. You can't win with that. Like that's like, I mean, in my mind, why growing up with Captain uh, Ultimate Alliance, Captain America would never say Hail Hydra, but that was one of the funniest scenes in, in, in game. <laughs> Yo, no, like, so, like, like props to them for being able to troll the entire <laughs> comic book fan base with that line that people just threw through oh, 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 a, a near war for over the comics. Oh my mm-hmm. goodness! That Bravo. was like such a great. That was that was. A, I mean, I feel like that level of filmmaking was Zack Snyder brought. But I feel like, I mean, just to be honest, Endgame had a lot more years and a lot more behind it. So of course that shines a little brighter given the context. But Zack Snyder's Justice League isn't like it's like three grade grades below. It's really close in terms of the grade of that kind of care and like uh, really sophistication. But you know, that being said. There's, I mean, I, there's a lot of smart stuff in Endgame, but I, I did feel kind of lengthy at times. But I mean, that's another. Again, we're talking about just League, and then I bring up Endgame, <laughs> which again is one of, it's my favorite Marvel film. It used to be Black Panther, but now with Endgame, because it just hit on so many levels. Uh, I'm still torn between Endgame and uh, Winter Soldier. Still, I mean, that's a good comparison. Yeah, but I feel like Winter Soldier. I mean, for me, when it came out, I liked it, but it just felt almost you know, any side character films like with like Thor, Dark World, Iron Man Two, Winter Soldier. It just felt like it was lower stakes, and you you kind of going into it, I knew the characters would get out safely, so I always had that precognition going into it. So I never got to enjoy the film as it is, just as a standalone, or as a Captain America movie, because I said, okay. Well, that's that, but we got Ultron. He's going to be in there. See, Maybe that, not Bucky. That was the exact reason why I think it stood out to me the most, because while I knew all all of that, the overarching story, how it would play out and people would get out and the stakes aren't that high, I think mm-hmm. Winter Soldier, for me, just felt far more deeply rooted into the character of Captain, or, I'm sorry, Captain Marvel, Captain America. Because, it did. 
it, it was his turning point from the tried and true blue, you know, states Star Spangled Banner that we got from, you know, Captain America uh, one, uh, first adventure. And to see him be able to deal with things, start turning, and then like literally question his country, question his actions, and then holding on to one of the only few things he has left from his actual past, his best friend, and how that was tormenting him on a scale to the point where he's like, I'm not going to let this go. And he literally chases his best friend. It, to me, it, that was the... The, the the spotlight and everything else going around it was just just like you know dessert like you know like extra extra food you know yeah. and it it, it I, just spoke to me I, I I don't know yeah I guess um I guess I mean I, I I did like after watching that I was like I wish we could see more Bucky in these upcoming films which we really didn't get to see that relationship more but I mean with Winter Soldier Falcon Winter Soldier we get more like context which is good mm. um but. I guess that when I watched it, like I really appreciated that, and like it hit emotionally. But I just think Endgame just being, it came out the right time at the right moment. Like I watched it the day I graduated college, so yeah. just seeing the end of an era, <laughs> all the emotions. Uh, I feel like they did Scarlet uh, uh, Widow uh, dirty, Black Widow. Black oh Widow, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, yes. mixing two characters. <laughs> yeah. It's like you wanna you want your you want your uh, spinoff movie you're gonna have to you're gonna have to do it. <laughs> it's like oh damn it. Oh, by the way, I think the thing cut off. Oh, did it? The recorder. Let me see. Oh yeah. Well, it just cut off. I, I noticed that so. Okay, and that's fine. Like, I, I always have a, a backup recording locally going as mm -hmm. well. Um, yep, I guess we can. I guess this is the end. To the, near the end of the hour, we can. You can uh, <laughs> kind of uh, summarize or, or wrap up, and I guess I can plug in what I need to plug in, which is really nothing really at this point. Uh, I haven't started posting a DVNR. I'm still figuring out what to do. So I'm like, we'll figure that out along the way. Let me just focus on the the, the manga because I'm not releasing planning on releasing it for a while, but I'm going to release concept art. Um, but early concept art, so might not be as good. But it's, it's done, <laughs> right? You, if it's done, you ship it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And then hopefully the newer ones that I'm doing will will be better looking. Um, yeah. But yeah, so if I'm gonna be reoccurring, I might wait to uh, actually to, to wait to actually disclose it once I actually have some stuff on my account. My uh, deviant art name is Rupee Wise. Ooh, like Pennywise. Yeah, I was just about, I was just about to say. <laughs> cool all right well so, we do the wrapping up outro and uh, I, will, I will i will say that at least you, you have some work coming down the pipeline and hopefully by the next time we have you on the show you'll be ready to disclose said work oh yeah build up anticipation yeah yeah okay <clears throat> All right, guys, there you have it. We're approaching our uh, timestamp for the end of the show. It's been a great conversation. Uh, Ishak, it's been great having you uh, on the podcast. Hope you thoroughly enjoyed it as well. I did. Thank you. I did. Awesome. Uh, so, guys, uh, we're going to begin to step out. Uh, I would like to say that uh, Ishak is working on some very cool projects down the pipeline. And so by the time we have him back on the show, he might have a... Uh, something to drop and so, so, you know, something to tease you with a little, a little, a little taste, a little sample, a little, a little barbecue on the ribs, you know? Yeah. Uh, to give it, uh, I guess, a, a hint, it has something to do with dragons and their abogados. <laughs> cojones. <laughs> um, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> Super cojones. That. <laughs> Not the Z cojones, the super. Yo, the, the funny thing is, um, in the, the the current arc in the manga for Super, uh, oh man, the, the, that's such a it's been it's been such we can get into that, but I just I'm done with Super, man. Like it was good, <laughs> it was it was so good, and then they had to go, oh, let's do an Easter egg to sell, but it doesn't make sense, and then it's like, oh wait, now Goku can make an avatar and can be a kaiju. It's like what the heck? This, uh, where where were the endings where it was like a satisfying ending, like a father and son beating this demon which represents their own demons or like goku needing the whole world to finish off blue bibu because 
it's finally him not being a part of like it's not his power it's everyone else's power that kills the bad guy or like the biggest thing which is like your birthright as a saiyan <laughs> super saiyan <laughs> defeat frieza none of that shit it's like oh well, by the way he can turn into a monster now <laughs> uh see well we might have some extra or interesting topics for future podcast shows there, there no, there's go. nothing interesting about Super now. Did you see the later chapter? Oh, by the way, if you use a Dragon Ball, you can be as strong as Beerus. I was like, what? <sighs> oh, oh, only only with the caveat of we'll shorten your lifespan, you know, to to show out your potential. And it's like, and it, it, oh, okay. what, would, <laughs> what would you rather have? A hundred years as this, as you know, basically a peasant, or like three years as a god? It's like, right. easy choice, easy choice. Oh. And then just get other the rest of the Dragon Balls next year and say, oh, by the way, I want to be immortal. It shall be done. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. God. Yes. Yeah, it's like there's only two Dragon Balls on, on that. It's, it's not that hard to keep gathering them and wishing. Like, I, it, anyway. <laughs> and, yeah, anyway. So we'll see you in a future episode of Essence in After Dark. I've been your host, <laughs> Zang Zenokami Blaylock, joined with the guest, uh, Ishtiak Ponir. And uh, until the next time we see you or speak with you, Make sure you take care, drink water, be safe, and hopefully get vaccinated. Thank you. Yep.